Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here, so nice to be in this great church. You know, my wife and I, um, we came down here, uh, we have a second home here in Odessa, and on March 4th, we said to one another really the week before, you know, we got a huge April, May, June, July, my wife's going to do another album project, and I was going to be traveling here, there, everywhere, just a lot of things. Let's go down to Florida for just four days, from Sunday night to Friday, 12 noon, uh, fly back on a Delta flight. And the first day we were here, the world went sideways on us. And uh, we got calls from the pastors and the board and saying, don't get on a plane, don't go anywhere, there's nothing you can do here. Church is shut down, office is shut down. So we came for four days and we're here for six months. We are Floridians right now, you know. I'm rooting for the Tampa Bay Bucks. Forget everything in New York here. Uh, but it's a joy to be here. And another great thing about this morning is uh, my wife and I, because I've been doing uh, over at Idlewild Baptist Church, my friend Ken Witten has given me the videography team and the auditorium. I'm doing five daily devotions and on a day of heavy taping over there, Sunday sermon, sometimes Tuesday. And um, then it plays up in New York and all that. So this is the first time, a long time, that my wife and I have gotten in a car and come to church. We're in church this morning. How many say amen? So we've been backslid for six months now and finally in church again. Uh, but it's a joy to be here, and I really feel at home here. My wife and I want you to know we really feel very comfortable. I really want to uh, thank Pastor Paul and the leadership here to invite me, and uh, God is doing something here. Do I get an amen, or are you allowed to say amen in here? I forgot. Um, I really am happy to be here, and... Um, my wife and I started a lot of years ago in downtown Brooklyn in a rundown building with less than 15 people in the church. And the first collection we took was $85. And we already had a daughter by then. And uh, so she got a second job and I got a second job. Got to pay the bills. And with $85 offerings, uh, everything was up in the air. But you know what? All these years later, God is faithful. Amen. God, let's give God just a hand clap of praise. God is faithful. So I didn't come here to talk about me. I want to talk to you about the word of God. In the book of 1 Samuel, you don't need to turn to it, but I just, this passage I want to read to you takes up uh, um, really two or three chapters. Um, two chapters really, and uh, I just want to give a verse here. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 16, uh, he led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. And David fought them, forget who, I'll get to that, David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, more than 24 hours. And none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. This is an obscure verse and an obscure story that most people don't know about David. David, as you know, was the king, really the most famous king of Israel. Jesus is not called son of Solomon or son of Jehoshaphat, but king, uh, son of David. David, very special in the Old Testament, isn't he? And the stories that most of us know is David slaying Goliath and uh, the lion and the bear before that and David writing Psalms and all of his exploits. But before he became king, already his life was up and down in every which way. 
Because after he slew Goliath, the Philistine champion, everyone should have been applauding in Israel because they saved his, uh, he saved their bacon in a big way. But not Saul. Saul got jealous. Of all the emotions that you can have in your life, the deadliest is jealousy. Murder, the Bible says wrath is terrible and anger, but nobody can stand before jealousy. When someone's jealous of you because of God's blessing on your life, it, it, church is out. It's over. There's no way you can reason with them. Nothing, because they resent what God has done for you. And jealousy, unfortunately, is a sin that can live among believers, among pastors, among churches. It's a deadly thing. By the way, jealousy is the sin that got Jesus on the cross. When they brought him to Pilate, Pilate saw that the religious leaders were jealous of him. That's why they put him up. They couldn't do what he did. They couldn't speak like he spoke. So Saul got jealous of David because he heard this big song back then. You know, we were just singing uh, God Almighty Hallelujah. But there was a big song back there, and it went like this. It went, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul didn't like that. It was a big song back then, but Saul didn't like it. Jealous of David. So he went off, like went to a spiritual madness, and uh, he started trying to kill David. So David now is forced away from his wife, his parents, and he's on the run. And Saul has, at times, the whole army of Israel trying to chase down the guy who is loyal to him and who loves him and who's been the champion of Israel. Makes no sense. But a lot of things in life make no sense when Satan gets involved. So now, David, there's all kinds of psalms that were written while David was on the run. He's living in a cave. He's living in the desert. He's living everywhere. And the Bible tells us that the Bible declares that in those hours of need, David would cry out to God, and that's how we get a lot of Psalms. Where are you, God? Where are you? My enemies are increased. They're after me. That's what David was going through. So at one point, you won't believe this, David ended up living with the Philistines, the very people who were his former enemies. But King Achish saw of the Philistines that David was loyal, Saul was trying to kill him. Where could David go? And David had been joined by about 600 malcontent, discontented people who knew David's the anointed one, not Saul. Saul's going crazy. He's consulting witches and every kind of thing. And David's the man. So they're living with David in a town called Ziklag in the, in the territory of the Philistines. Well, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. The Philistines go to war, and guess who they're going to war against? The Israelites. And David lines up with the, Israelite, uh, with the Philistines. And he's ready to battle with his men because he's been over a year with the Philistines, and he's loyal to King Achish. So he lines up at a place called Aphek, and they're ready to go to battle, and Israel's over there coming, and there's going to be a big brouhaha. Well, some of the generals of the Philistine army see David and his 600 men lining up and they go, no, no, yo, time out. No way. King Achish, wake up, smell the coffee. You can't go to battle with David on your side. This is David. He's a Hebrew. He's a Jew. And this is the guy that they used to sing about. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And some of those tens of thousands were us. You can't go fighting with him on your side. But he's been loyal. No, no, we won't go to battle if he's with us. So King Achish has to tell David, David, go back. No, I want to fight with you. Uh, you know, David was a very unusual person. He was a musician, but he was a, a fighter. Most musicians don't want to fight and go into battle. And most people who are strong in warfare don't write songs like David did. David was unique. So he says, no, you got to go back home. So David and his men have to travel long distance back to Ziklag, this little town where they have settled with their wives, their children, and all of their livestock. So as they're going back, can't fight in the battle, as they go back, they see smoke. They see smoke in the air. 
So they quickened their pace a little bit, and yo, know, that's that's where Ziklag is. So now they hurry their pace and they're running, and they get to Ziklag, and it's been burned to the ground. And no wife, no son, no daughter, no livestock, no possessions are there. What they don't know is that the Amalekites, a roaming bunch of raiders who in the Old Testament are anti-God at all times. They're almost like a type of Satan, always fighting God's people. They have raided while David was away and they captured every wife, every son, every daughter, all the livestock, everything. It's all captured. And then they take off with them and they burn Ziklag to the ground. When David and his men, and these were tough hombres, when David and his men see what's happened, they're overwhelmed by grief. They begin to weep until they have no more tears. Very typical when you have grief that you can't deal with, you have to turn and vent on someone. And the men turn on David, their, their own leader. The 600 guys say, what were we doing out there with King Achish? Why, why did we leave our, our, our families unguarded? Like, what's the deal with this, David? What kind of leader are you? They actually got to the point they talked of stoning David. And the Bible says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Aren't you happy that no matter how hard it gets, you can always find strength in God. You can find grace to keep going, keep moving. So, so um, David kind of gains his composure and then he does one of these great things that he's known for when he's at his best. He calls for the priest who traveled with him, who had an ephod. I'm not going to go into all that, but it was in a garment uh, that the priest wore. And through it and some stones that were on it, you could consult God and inquire of him what to do. It's not exactly clear in the Old Testament how that all worked, but it was a way of inquiring of God, not about doctrine, not about what's wrong, what's right. Moses gave the Ten Commandments. They don't change. But there's a lot of other questions in life that we need to inquire of the Lord about. Should I be a missionary? Who should I marry? All the Bible says is marry a believer. But there's a lot of them out there. So which one is the one? You, you do believe that God leads and guides his people. Raise your hand if you still believe that. Amen? So he inquired of the Lord. And he said, should I chase whoever did this? God says, yes. Will I catch him? Si, sí, senor. Yes. So David and his men take off, directed by God, and they just start racing off into the sunset. They're in a desert area, and they see a guy half dead in the sand. It's an Egyptian guy. They see that he's almost gone, so they give him some water, they give him some food, the Bible tells us, and he comes to, gains strength, and they say, who are you? Well, I'm, I'm an Egyptian, I'm a slave. I've been a slave of the Amalekites. And we've been racing around here in Philistine territory and in the desert down here, and we robbed here and we robbed here, and oh yeah, we burnt down Ziklag. Oh, you burnt down Ziklag. That's what the Amalekites did, David said. Yeah, yeah. So David said, can, can you take me to where they are? Because you know their habits and their hiding places. The guy says, yeah, you, I will, but you got to promise, swear to me, you won't kill me when you find them. David said, you're good to go. You're safe. So he leads them, and David and his men go, and after traveling a, a, a ways, they come to a little high place, and they look down in the valley, and there are all the Philistines. I'm sorry, the Amalekites. All the Amalekites are there. And they're parting. They're high-fiving. They're doing the bump. They're doing everything. They're just happy. They're drunk. And all the wives are there. And all the children are there. The sons, the daughters, the cattle, everything. Plus other plunder that they had gathered. And the Bible says that David went down at dusk, down into that place where the Amalekites were. And from dusk until the next night, he fought them. 
And that's the day that David discovered that God recovers stolen property. Did you hear me? God recovers stolen property. Because after fighting them under the banner of the Lord and by God's strength, they brought back every man, every child, every woman. And these were rough and tough days. When those children were missing and those wives, th th these were crude pagan days. Just think how those fathers were thinking, where's my 16-year-old daughter? Where's my 28-year-old wife? What's going on with my 12-year-old boy? That's why they panicked and cried so much. But oh, David recovered them all and he found out that God recovers stolen property. Now, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I live in New York City my whole life, except to go away to college a period of time. My wife was born in Chicago, but really has lived her whole life in Brooklyn. We're New Yorkers. You're not a true New Yorker unless you've been robbed. Sometimes on a service on Sunday, I'll say, okay, how many have ever been ripped off of something? You know, people just lift their hands all over. Pickpocket, broken into cars, whatever. Because there's just a lot of thievery. I know it's not like that in Tampa, but I'm, I'm just, just saying. So some years ago, I had a car, a lot of years ago, and I went to go to it and I saw the window cracked, busted, and someone had gotten in my car and stolen my airbag. A crack addict for sure, because at that time they were doing that a lot and the airbag was worth at a chop shop where you could go and get quick money, just enough to get some more crack because it has a voice, it calls you, and when it calls you, they tell you, you're coming. The question is just, how do you get the money? You're not saying no to crack. So, it was, the airbag was gone, and, and I was like, yo, what is this? My airbag's gone. Didn't take the car, just the airbag. So, I didn't know, should I report it to the insurance and my rates go up, should I just fix it myself, and all of that. I got it fixed. Six months later, car parked in the same spot. Window broken again. Airbag gone again. I'm positive it was the same guy. We were developing like a personal relationship through this whole thing. I was gonna leave him cookies and milk and we could talk next time. So that was stolen and that could be recovered or a new one put in. Now, J Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have and have it more abundantly. Listen again, speaking of Satan, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But I, Jesus, son of God, Messiah, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Notice the enemy steals before he kills and destroys. Well, what would Satan be interested in stealing? You know, the Amalekites stole all the children and the produce, livestock, I should say, and the wives. What would, what would Satan want to steal from your life? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. He's a thief. He's the master thief. He could have robbed or is robbing right now from some of you, but that's the uniqueness of how clever he is. You don't even know he's robbing you. You know, I was once in Madrid, Spain, preaching, and I was with my interpreter, and we were walking down a crowded street in downtown Madrid, and uh, this blind guy, maybe he wasn't blind, uh, sitting in a chair with some people around them. They had a whole thing going on. Oh, man. And we were from New York. Uh, you would think we picked it up. We did, but a little late. And he was there at a can and, and begging for money, yelling out in Spanish. And uh, we stopped. And suddenly he grabbed my friend's uh, pants 
grabbed a pen. My friend, very uh, fluent in Spanish, uh, spent most of his adult life in Argentina. And, and then he was hitting his thing, his cane, and then there was music playing, and then these guys jostled my friend, and, and he's grabbing his pants leg, and uh, some money dropped. It was just all like crazy, distracting. And then my friend got upset and said, get your hand off of me like this, and all of that. And I, I yelled at him quickly within like 10 seconds, check your wallet, and he went, gone. Distracted, stolen. You know, when thieves come, they usually don't send an email or text you and say, yo, I'm coming by in about 10 days. Try to have things neat for me when I come to rob you. What do they do? They distract. But the question is, what would Satan be interested in stealing? I got credit cards here. He's not interested in any of them or yours. Do you have a house? Keep it. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He didn't live in a house. You have a nice car? Keep it. He moves about on his own. He doesn't need your car. You got retirement money? You got nice clothes? Not even interested. But Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What would, what would Satan be interested in stealing? And maybe you're stealing today. Number one, just think about this. He steal your peace. Some of you here, he's so distracted, possibly, that you have lost your peace. He came to bring peace. He's the prince of peace. But he brings us into condemnation. He keeps reminding us of where our sins and where we failed God. And now we lose our peace. Not peace with God, but our, the peace of God. And now we're all troubled. We get you distracted by all the turmoil going on in society and the pandemic. And when will it end? And what will be the new normal? And this and that. And then he's so happy because now you, you've lost your peace. You didn't even know he did it. When Satan steals, he doesn't tell you he's stealing. He just steals. How about your joy? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And maybe you're sitting here today, you're in church, but you don't have joy. You don't wake up in the morning with joy. You're half depressed or you're caught up, you're caught up, uh, you're caught up with all this political anger and hate going on, racial hate. You don't have joy. I've been talking to pastors all over Florida. Uh, the, the social media, blogs and all of that, it, it's demonic. Christians destroying Christians. Not the world destroying the world. Christians destroying Christians. Love, joy, peace? No, I'm at you. You don't hold my position? You're a demon. You're not saying amen, but it's true. You don't have to say amen. It's absolutely true. Who do you think's behind that? Jesus? No joy, no peace, just fussing and fighting. Talking about nothing but politics or whatever. Not the word of God in our mouths. No, fussing and fighting in our mouths. Oh, this and that. And the election and this and that. You think Jesus would live that way? No, that's Satan. He's stealing our peace and our joy. How are you going to witness to someone you're mad at? How are you going to witness to someone you don't even want to be with? Think of it. This is for pastors, their wives, everyone. People I'm constantly with now and talking and talking to friends around the country, well-known ministers, they tell me it's like no peace, no joy, love has disappeared, and it's doggy dog. In the church, in the world, I expect that. Come on, we're grown up. When I'm in New York City, it's, it's not a Bible school. It's New York City. But my goodness, among believers, Satan is so clever, just ripped you off, has ripped us off of peace and joy and love, compassion on people. You know, you got to be careful with that. I'm not the pastor, but I have the authority here to warn you from the word of God. You, you get fussing with people, uh, whether it's racial or political and all that, be careful. How are you going to go to heaven? Why would God punish you by sending you to heaven to be with people you don't want to be around? Just think of that. No, I'm, I'm not a legalist, but think about that. Why would Jesus send some of us to heaven to be with people that on earth were just squabbling with all the time? 
Very, very dangerous. By this shall all men know you're my disciples because you love one another. Satan, he's working. He's working. It's not the Democrats or the Republicans. Please, don't even hint that any of them have an answer. Jesus is the only answer. Can we put our hands together? Say amen to that. You hear people talk sometime and you wonder, do you ever read the Bible? Do you ever spend time in God's word? How about something else? Your first love. Ah, now you're talking turkey. Now you're talking something he's interested in. Your first love. Was there ever a moment where you loved the word of God more? When Jesus meant more, you had more faith? You prayed about everything? Your heart was tender. You got convicted easily of sin. You wanted to be just like Jesus every day. What happened to that? It didn't evaporate. Nothing evaporates. The thief comes to steal. Remember that church that Jesus wrote to in Revelation? I have this against you. You lost your first love. Preachers lose their first love. They get mechanical. They just pump out sermons and want to make a salary. They've lost their first love, but when they started, it wasn't that way. When they started, it was brokenness before the Lord. Oh, Jesus, use me. Let me be a blessing. And now it's like they're CEOs. Yeah, that's something he'd be interested in, your first love. One last one, maybe. How about your calling? You know, when Saul of Tarsus got converted and Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, one of the first things Saul said was, Lord, Lord, who are you? And I am Jesus and all that. And Saul said, what will you have me to do? Was, you, you're, you're revealing yourself to me. You, you, you're Christians here. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here this morning. So why are you a Christian? What's the purpose? I know we're all going to heaven. No more work there. But what's the assignment that Jesus given you? Wait a minute. You don't really think he saved you to come to church on Sunday. Oh, that's a joke. Where would you find that in the scripture? Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, so that for an hour and ten minutes you would come to church on Sunday. No way, Jose. No way. There's a calling. Maybe you're supposed to reach kids. Or you're going to be a prayer warrior. Or you're going to be a witness for Christ. Or maybe you're going to serve in the church and sing on the worship team or be a musician. But every one of you, you have a calling on your life. That's why so many Christians are frustrated and empty. Because they're saved, but they're on a treadmill. They just go to church, but they go nowhere. They never think, Lord, why did you save me? What's my purpose in the kingdom? What's the part that I'm supposed to play in the body of Christ? Not everyone's a hand, not everything's a knee, but we all need every part functioning. And the American uh, model now is get saved and go to church. You talk to most Christians and you say, yo, how are you doing? Oh, I go to First Baptist. I go to First Assembly of God. I go to Brooklyn Tabernacle. That's not anything. That's where you go on Sunday. But how are you doing with the Lord? Ah, that's Satan again, stealing. He's such a thief, such a thief. He'll make us content just like we're doing people a favor. I go to church. Hey, pastor, yo, back up, pastor. I come on Sunday. It's like, that's why Christ died, so you would come to a building on Sunday. God has much more, but Satan doesn't want us to have that. Listen, my wife and I have had a lot of struggles in the ministry. She's won six Grammy Awards. She's not trained musically. She directs a great choir, writes songs. She's super gifted, much more than I am. I wasn't trained to be in the ministry. I never went to a Bible school or seminary. So God called unlikely people into the ministry. You know when we're happiest? When we're doing the work of the Lord. That's when you're happiest. What, cashing a paycheck? Going to Bermuda for a week? Oh, come on. Sinners do that. People who curse God do that. That ain't no big thing. But to work for Jesus, see people get saved, serve someone who's hurting, mm. can't let Satan rob that. A lot of years ago, my wife and I, we had our oldest girl, Chrissy. I'll close with this. It was my bad. 
more than her bad. But I took my eye off my daughter. And when you're in downtown Brooklyn and the doors are open to everyone, you don't know where the problem could come from. And the problem, this guy walked right in the church. My daughter got involved with him. A wall, a barrier went between us and my daughter. We saw her getting harder every day, like this, hard. Dura. And we're pastoring and renting Radio City Music Hall and starting other churches, and my wife's busy, and I'm, I'm doing that. We had two other children after that, but Chrissy's getting out there. We tried everything. You know, when Satan goes to steal one of your children, you try everything. You yell, you scream, you cry, you try to use money. We went through a two and a half year long nightmare with capital N. Our wayward daughter. How do you preach when you don't know your, where your daughter is? How do you lead the Brooklyn Tabernacle and direct a choir when your heart is broken and it's hanging by a thread? But after two and a half years in a prayer meeting, the church mounted up and prayed a prayer that broke through and within 24 hours, Chrissy, who I hadn't seen in five months, appeared on our doorstep with the baby that she had had out of wedlock. God recovers stolen property. She was broken. She was broken. She was smashed. The Lord had visited her in a dream, showed her where she was heading at 90 miles an hour to an abyss, grabbed her, hugged her, told her he still loved her. And now she's a pastor's wife in Chicago, has her own ministry. She's a lot like her mother, super gifted, doesn't technically know what she's doing. She just keeps doing it. And God, yeah, let's give God. Come on, to God, all the praise. So, Jesus recovers stolen property. What you have to do is bring it to him and not dance around or go into denial. If something's been stolen, you can't go, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. Or my daughter's okay. You know if your daughter's okay. You know if your son's not serving the Lord. Come on. You know if you lost your peace. You know if you're just becoming a mechanical Christian, lost your first love. I've been through this a thousand times with the Lord. Oh, Lord, recover what the enemy's trying to steal. Jesus loves you. He has all power. But you got to draw a line in the sand. You got to pray. You got to call out to God and say, Jesus, recover the thing that the enemy's trying to steal. My calling. You know, someone here, you used to have dreams of God really using you. And then what happened? You got distracted. You were in a church split or something. That's all satanic. That's all to distract you away from pursuing what God wants you to do and be. If you get what I'm talking about, just say amen. amen. So, as our sister who was playing before just comes back to the keyboard, would you close your eyes with me and just bow your heads, please? I have a special burden, as often happens when I preach this message or talk about my daughter. If you're here today and you have a wayward child not serving the Lord, or grandchild, and you know they're in trouble, they're not doing well, would you just stand up? I would love the honor to pray for you. Just stand up right where you are. Pastor, this was for me. Stand up right where you are. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. I just opened and was transparent with you. Is there anybody else here while we're all praying who would say, Pastor Jim, I, I, I got convicted. I, I realize Satan is trying to rip me off. That thief, what Jesus called him is right. The thief comes to steal. And I want Jesus to recover those things that the enemy's trying to take from me. 
Some of those things I mentioned or maybe things I didn't mention. But God convicted you of it. God's pointing it out because he loves you. He wants to go and recover the stolen property like David did. David recovered everything and then some. That's what Jesus said. I'll make you more than conquerors. You'll recover what the enemy has stolen and then you'll have even more plunder for the glory of the name of Jesus. If you're here and would just like me to pray for you at the very end here along with these others who are standing you stand too pastor that was for me I want to recover something just stand up right where you are thank you stand up thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you nothing to be embarrassed about you know pride holds us back that's the killer we can't get to the place where we say, Ajudo no, Senor, help me, Lord. Anybody else just want to stand? Because when I pray, I pray. I want to pray a prayer of blessing and recovery over your life. A prayer of blessing and recovery. What the enemy has stolen, Jesus is going to recover. Praise God. Praise God. So, anyone else want to stand? If I was normal times, I would ask everyone who's standing to come forward here so I could have you a little closer, see you. But that's probably not wise given the situation now of distancing. So I'm just going to pray from here. But it doesn't matter where you are, where I am. It matters where Christ is. At the throne of grace saying, I will give you mercy and grace. Just come boldly and ask me. So, Father God, we ask now in the name of Jesus. You brought me here today to be a blessing, not a hindrance. Make me a blessing today by taking your words from your word, from your scripture, and applying them to the people's lives with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, now quicken your word that Jesus recover stolen property. We pray first for wayward sons and daughters. Wake them up. Wake them up in the name of Jesus. Wake them up. Shake them up. Whatever you have to do to get their attention. We don't care how deep they have sunk. You recover stolen property. Where sin abounds, grace even more abounds. If they're with people who have led them away, make them break up with those people. Let them have a fight today. So they get away from those bad influences. We pray that you would recover peace into our hearts and lives. You would save us from all the chaos of our country and our culture. Save us from that. Give us your joy again, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's your joy, your peace that we want. It doesn't change with circumstances. It's your joy, your peace. Restore the calling that you have on these precious people, Lord. You save them for a purpose. Show them the purpose. Don't let the enemy sidetrack them and hijack them. Let them pursue why you save them and the good that they can do here through the body of Christ serving the community. We thank you that we belong to you. And though we are weak, you are strong. Though we don't know, you know everything. So we, in the name of Christ, lay all these things at your feet. Starting today, everything's going to change. Somebody say amen. Starting today, everything's going to change. Children are going to start to come back. And we're going to give you all the praise. Joy, peace, energy, devotion, prayer, Bible study. Quicken us now according to your word. Recover stolen property so that your name can be praised. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, 